In this video, I'm going to run through the GCSE Combined Science Trilogy Foundation Tier Paper for Physics Paper 2. I hope you find it useful. Question 1.1 says, which of these is a scalar quantity? Now, a scalar quantity, remember, means it's only got a magnitude or a size. That's what it means. Magnitude means size. Whereas a vector quantity has a size and a direction. So displacement has both size and direction. Distance just has size. So that's going to be our correct answer in this case. Force has size and direction, and velocity also has size and direction. In question 1.2, it says a woman cycled along a straight, flat road. Figure 1 shows how the woman's velocity changed with time. Which part of the graph shows when the woman was moving at a constant velocity, and you're expected to tick one box here? So remember, she's moving at constant velocity when she's going to be moving as a straight line here. So the bit where it's straight is, is between B and C, that's a constant velocity. Between A and B she's accelerating, and between C and D she's decelerating, and between D and E she's not moving. So the correct answer to this one is between B and C. So the next question, 1.3, says which part of the graph shows a woman move, a woman stationary? So we just get the graph back on so we can look at that for this question. So the rest of this question you'll be able to look over this side, because I've put the graph on. I want you to look at the part where... Um, which part of the graph shows when the woman's stationary? So when she's stationary, she's traveling at zero. And you can see that there's the zero marks along this line here, which means that between parts D and E, she's got no motion. So D and E would be the correct answer there. It says between points A and B, the woman was accelerating. Use figure one to determine the total time for which she was accelerating. So if you look at figure one, let's move it into the middle of the board here. You can see figure one, that she's accelerating and in terms of the time we are looking at this bottom axis so we're looking at this point here and we can read that from the graph you can see that that's 10 there in terms of the mo motion she's covered two and a half squares so that was for probably five seconds the next part of the question asks for what's the change in velocity well the velocity starts at zero you can see at the bottom and rise up to six so change in velocity is six meters per second so we can go back and fill those two things in now Get that back in the right place. So we had five seconds here, and we also had a change of six meters per second for this answer here. It now wants you to calculate the acceleration between points A and B. So the acceleration is change in velocity over time taken. Well, here we've got the increase in velocity being six. And the time taken we said is 5, so we just put these numbers into this equation here, and that will bring us out with our correct answer. Now, if you have made a mistake and got these two wrong, as long as you use these two values and use them correctly in this equation, you can still pick up two marks here. So now we use this equation, acceleration is change in velocity over time, we put the numbers in, so we've got change in velocity is 6, and our time is 5, so we put in 6 over 5 to get 1.2. We got one mark for 0.6 over 5 and one mark for 1.2. So the next question here is 1.7. says, so estimate how a typical cycling speed of 6 meters per second compares with a typical walking speed. So you should know from the specification that walking speed, or the typical walking speed, is equal to 1.5 meters per second. Which means, if it's 1.5 meters per second to get to 6, we'd have to times it by 4. So it's 4 times as fast to cycle. That brings us to the end of question 1. So please give yourself a mark out of 8 and get ready to move on to the next question. Question 2 shows you a slinky spring using a model for a sound wave. And we want you to use the, the labels in this box, box down here, to, uh, to label these points there. Okay, so you can see the first one is the distance between these two compressions so that's going to be a wavelength the next one which we're looking at in this case here I've already said that that's a compression a, com a compression being where the, uh, the spring is compressed together or pressed together and the bit that we're looking at here where we've got them spread apart we call the bit where it extends as a rare faction so there they are correctly labeled you get a mark for each of those and then actually to say what type of wave is a sound wave and you should know the sound wave is longitudinal, so you get a mark for that bit there. So the next question is, figure 3 shows a 
two students measuring the speed of sound in air. One student bangs two bricks together. The sound wave produces, produces reflected from the wall and travels back to the students. Describe how they can determine the speed of sound. So the key thing we're looking at here is speed. Okay, and we've also got the idea that it's reflected from the wall. So in terms of how you need to be able to calculate speed, you might want to have a bit of a, an idea of planning this um, answer first. And the thing that they need to be able to work out speed is you'll need the speed equation, where speed is equal to distance over time. So here you can see that I've written speed is distance over time. For me, this is how I go about doing it, is I would then say, well, okay, so to find speed, I'm going to have to work out distance and time. How am I going to use distance? Well, you can measure distance using a ruler to the wall and then times that distance by two because it's got to reflect back. And in terms of time, what would I use to measure time? Well, I'd use a stopwatch to time from when the bricks were banged together until the point where I heard that noise come back from the wall. Having planned that in that way and using the equation, I would probably ensure that I got most of the marks there. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put up the indicative content of the example I expect you to include for this question. So then you can see on the screen the source of content you should have included. So measure the distance between a student with the bricks and the wall. You can use a trundle wheel or a tape measure for that. You can measure the time taken for the, bring, uh, the banging of the bricks to the echo. Double the measure distance to see the distance travelled or half a time if you're only going one way. And then use speed as distance over time. You can repeat timings, remove anomalies and calculate a mean. But including most of that content will allow you to get the four marks that are available for this question. Finally, um, the last thing I want to say about this is that this is how you're actually marked you're using this level descriptors. So a level two question, the method would lead to a production of a valid outcome. Key steps are identified and logically sequenced. Okay, so the idea is that you're actually going to be able to calculate speed and that speed is going to have is going to be valid in terms of the fact that you're not calculating correctly. Whereas a level one response, the method would not necessarily lead to a valid outcome. Some relevant steps are identified but links are not made clear. So when your teacher gives you a mark for this question, they will use this to decide whether you get three to four marks or one to two. And then they would use the indicative content, which is down here, in a order to establish whether you get um, one or two marks if you're in level one box, or you get three or four marks if you're in a level two box. So you can give yourself a mark out of eight for that question, and we're going to move on to question three. So next question, question three says, show, show figure four shows a man doing two stages of a pull-up. In both diagrams, the man is stationary. And once you complete the sentence, choose from the answers below. In stage one, the downward force on the man on the bar is something to the force of the bar and the man. So the fact that he's ha hanging there stationary, they should be equal to one another. So you can see that equal to gives you the mark there. Question 3.2 says the man has a mass of 85 kilograms and the gravitational field strength is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. So you want you then to put those values in. So I'm just going to change the colour of that, I'll make that red instead. So you can see gravitational field strength goes there, and the mass would go here. So is the equation editor, if I wanted to write that in, I would just say that weight is going to equal 85 times 9.8. So using that, you get one mark for putting the numbers in correctly. So you can see here that 85 times 9.8, and the second mark for getting the correct answer of 833. Newtons. Now you could round that to 830 Newtons and still get that mark for that question. Question 3.3 says the man raises his body a vertical distance of 0.63 to go from stage 1 to stage 2. Calculate the work done by the man. Use your answer to question 3.2 and work done is force multiplied by distance. Now the trick here is remembering that weight is actually a force. So the 833 for our force for our weight in the first question is going to be the force in this question, and so we're going to do 833 multiplied by 0 0.63. Now, if you made a mistake in the first part of the question, you're just going to be able to get the error carried forward mark here, as long as you're consistent. So you can see here, put that into calculator then, we get a mark for writing that in and substituting it into the numbers. So 833 times 0.63, you stick that into your calculator and get an answer. And the answer is 525 joules, so that will get you the second mark for this question. So you have one mark for doing the calculation, one mark for getting the correct answer. Question 3.4 says the man was not moving at stage 2. How much work is done by the man at stage 2? So if he's not moving, there's no distance being travelled, therefore he's doing no work. So work done would be equal to zero. So zero joules, we get the mark for that question there. The final one says a woman uses the bar to do a pull-up. The woman has a mass of 62 kilograms. She, ac she accelerates at 11 meters per second. Calculate the resultant force of the woman. So here... 
you got the 62 kilograms with the mass and you then got the 11 meters per second for the acceleration so you're just going to put those into the equation and calculate an answer so you can see here i've put those numbers into the equation and that will get you the first mark doing 62 times 11 and the second mark comes from getting the correct answer which is 682 newtons so please give yourself a mark out of eight and we're going to move on to question four in question four it's figure five shows the type of waves within the electromagnetic spectrum some of the types of waves are represented by letters p Microwaves Q, visible light, R, S, and gamma rays. Which letters show the position of ultraviolet radiation with the electromagnetic spectrum? So you should know that we'd end up with, uh, we'd start off with uh, radio, microwave, that would be infrared, that would be UV, and that would be X. So the correct one here is going to be R. So the special lamp can produce ultraviolet radiation. Which do two statements describe electromagnetic waves emitted by a UV lamp? So the all electromagnetic waves remember have the same speed, so it will have the same speed as visible light. Um, and they will have a lower frequency than gamma ray rays because gamma rays are the most frequent of all the rays. So those are the marks for this question this this part of the question. In the next question it says UV radiation is used to treat a vitamin D deficiency. People should not use a UV lamp for long periods of time. They want to take two risks of exposure to high levels of ultraviolet radiation. For this question you can have any two of the following three. So aging of the skin, skin cancer or eye damage. You're not allowed cancer by itself, um, it has to be skin cancer. So you get two marks for any uh, two of those three there. The next part of the question says ionizing radiation is used for some medical imaging. Name two types of electromagnetic waves that are used for medical imaging. Um, so in this case you can have any of the three from gamma rays, x-rays and ultraviolet. So you get a maximum of two marks and you can have any of the three types of ray rays that we just discussed, gamma rays, x-rays and ultraviolet. I'll put them on, them on the screen for you. And so you can finish marking that question and give yourself a mark out of seven for question four. And we're going to move on to question five. So we're moving on to question five. Question five says figure six shows a man using a resistance band and exercising. The resistance band behaves elastic elastically. What happens to the start of elastic potential energy of the resistance band when the band is stretched? So the first mark for the first question, you just need to write that that will increase. Or well, the energy increases. That will get you the first mark. Okay, the next one, question says, explain what happens to the resistance band as it's released. Well, it's released, um, it will return to its original length. And the reason for that is it has an elastic force that restores it to its original length. So there you can see the two marks for this question. The first mark for saying returns to its original length, and the second mark is for getting the fact that that's down to the elastic force that returns it to its original length. Question 5.3 says, figure seven shows the extension of the resistance band changes as a force applied changes. It wants to describe the trend that's shown in the graph. So you can see there's lots of different areas to this graph. There's a fact that at first nothing seems to happen. Then we get a bit of an increase of the curve. We then have like a linear part, and then we get the fact that the end is coming back round. So there's lots of different parts we can describe here. It's two marks, so you would expect you to describe more than one part. So you get the marks, you can have any two of the following three uh, points to get the marks. The first bit is initially, the band does not stretch when a force is applied, and that's the bit that I've highlighted on the, the diagram with blue. When, uh, when extending, as the force increases, the extension increases, that's the part I've marked in green and red. And the idea that it's not a linear relationship identifies the parts of the green and yellow where we've got the bending of the, the line. So the line begins to curve. So that's green and yellow gets you the second mark. But hopefully, you can, hopefully what I've tried to do there is show you how you get all the marks from the graph by highlighting them and then coding the marks in that colour as well. So here, um, in issues figure eight, shows a chest expander. It says sketch a graph on figure nine to show the extension of the spring in the chest expander changes the force applied changes. So you get extension versus force here. That should be a linear relationship, so it should be a straight line, and that straight line should go through the origin so they're directly proportional to one another. So in terms of your, your line, this should be straight, and it should go straight through the middle there. Okay, I've, I've been a bit carried away with my line in trying to determine that it's straight, so you sh shouldn't necessarily go that high. We get the idea that it's a straight line, we get one mark, the diagonal, and the second mark is for the fact that it goes through the origin there. And that gives you the two marks for that question. 
The next question says, when a force is applied to a spring, the spring extends by 7.5 .7, centimetres. You want you to write down the equation that links extinction force and spring constant. So to do that, you know that force is equal to spring constant times extension. So that will get you one mark for correctly getting that equation right. Force is equal to spring constant times extension. And the next part of the question, it says, calculate the force applied to the spring, the spring constant of 1,600 nanometers. So with this, I'm just going to highlight it, you get the 1,600 nanometers, and you've also got up here 7.5 centimeters. Now the fact it's in centimeters means we need to convert that into meters because we can't carry out calculations in centimeters. So the first part of this question, uh, to get the mark, is to first of all realize that you've got to convert from centimeters into meters. So doing 7.5 centimeters divided by 100 to get 0 0.075 is going to get you the first mark. The next bit is we're going to now use that in the equation. So force is spring constant times extension. So we can substitute the two values in. So you can see here that I've substituted those numbers in. The 1,600 uh, for spring constant multiplied by 0 0.075 meters. And that's going to give me 120 newtons. In terms of the marking, you get one mark for getting them into the equation correctly and one mark for the final answer. Now, if you haven't done the 0 0.075, by uh, converting centimetres into metres by doing 7.5 over 100, then you still get error carried forward for this. And you get two marks. Please give yourself a mark for this question out of 11, and we're going to move on to question six. Figure 10 shows a lorry. It says the brakes of the lorry are in poor condition. What effect will the condition of the brakes have on thinking distance and the braking distance of the lorry? So for thinking distance, you don't need brakes. Brakes have no effect on thinking distance. So the answer there, the thing in this is we no effect. What will the effect will they have on braking distance? Well, if your brakes are poor and they're not um, working properly, then that's going to increase the distance it requires for you to brake. So braking distance would increase. So here you can see the two marks of this question. It's a mark for each. First of all, you get a mark for saying that thinking distance stays the same, and braking distance will increase is a second mark. Question 6.2 says using a handheld mobile phone device while driving is illegal in the United Kingdom. Tail 1 shows the effect of using mobile phone on thinking distance. Explain why driving while using a handheld mobile phone is more dangerous than using a mobile phone with a hands-free kit. It's worth four marks. So these are the marks that are um, expected from the exam board, and they've said that reaction time is increased by using a mobile phone. That's for, it applies for both of them. Okay, that get you the first mark, and you can see that because uh, not using it, you have a shorter distance for thinking distance than you do when you use either the hands-free kit one or the one that's held handheld handheld mobile phones increase the thinking distance more than hands-free phones the second mark the idea of using data now say by more than four meters and therefore you need to say that the overall stopping distance increases to get you the fourth mark and that is what you need to, to write for this question in order to get all the marks that brings us to the end of the question so please give yourself a, an overall score out of six um, for questions 7 and 8 for the foundation paper, please can you see the video for the higher tier paper and those are questions 1 and 2 on the higher tier. So you can go on to mark your work using the higher tier paper using questions 1 and 2. Thank you for listening and I really hope you found it useful.